All right, we're live in 50 se 15 seconds, everyone. Yeah. So, Ivo, I'm going to have to ask you to. <laughs> right. All right, we're live in 50 seconds. Good morning, everyone. Seconds, Thank everyone. you so much for, for joining us uh, this morning um, in this press uh, briefing, this press uh, chat to this press event. Um, at the very start, I'm going to ask everyone to ensure that they mute their mics throughout, except of course John and myself, just to make sure that um, we uh, maintain the, the relative order that this new way of public interaction can afford. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us, our journalists, friends in attendance, and to our friends uh, listening to this um, from home or from work or these days, those two things being uh, very much the same thing, it would seem. But um, this morning we are uh, having a conversation about uh, a new policy proposal from the Institute of Race Relations. I am Hadman Petuidius, the Deputy Head of Policy Research for the Institute, and joining me this morning is Mr. John Endres, the IRR's Chief of Staff, who uh, also was the lead author on the policy paper we'll be uh, uh, discussing this morning, and that is going out today, and that is currently on the website live for people uh, to have a look at. Uh, and to read and to uh, really uh, see if we make any useful proposals. I think one of the greatest sins a think tank can commit is to say something that is irrelevant. And that is, I think, why this um, policy paper is everything but a think tank sin, because I think it is as relevant as it is possible to be at this point. South Africa enters a greatly dangerous period for uh, our social economy and our political economy. And this comes on the back of 10 years of economic lockdown and then these last few months of the COVID-19 lockdown. And um, I think we can all agree that the state of the country is quite dire, not because graphs uh, and numbers are ticking in the wrong directions or being colored the wrong color on a graph, but because every one of those um, indicators reflects the standard of life in South Africa. It reflects a human experience of poverty, of suffering, and of, I think, declining hope and opportunities. So when we publish an economic paper like this as the Institute of Race Relations, it is not because we think numbers are interesting or because we think the abstraction of what we do is in and of itself useful. We do what we do because we understand perhaps better than any other country in the world that policy uh, has consequences and the consequences are human lives being affected positively or negatively. The Institute of Race Relations has a rich history, returning 91 this year. That means we saw the worst of apartheid um, and it is an honor for, for me as a young South African to work in this institute and to learn about the challenges that South Africa has faced in the past and overcome in the past. And that gives me hope that in the South African psyche, there is something incredibly durable and hopeful when it comes to crises. However, we understand in this time that we cannot rely on the state, we cannot rely on the government. So the question is, what can we rely on? And I think that is the question that John and I will seek to answer in our conversation this morning. John recently uh, 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 joined the IRR as, as chief of staff, um, and he has uh, uh, loads of experience in uh, business, in think tanks, um, and his uh, authorship of this paper really is revealing of his expertise in that regard and also presenting some of the best that the IRR has to offer in terms of quantitative and qualitative research. So, John, thank you very, very much for, for firstly, uh, writing a brilliant paper um, and, and secondly, joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Herman. It's good to be here. 
So let's get cracking. In terms of format, uh, John and I will have a conversation for, let's say, 20 or 30 minutes, after which uh, we will be able to receive questions from our journalist friends in attendance. And we ask um, that um, you put us on the spot. The, our job isn't to give easy answers, even if they are sometimes simple answers, but to really interrogate what we offer as solutions, as all uh, solutions or proposed solutions should be interrogated. Um, so take us at our word when we say that we think this can change things, this plan, and really put John uh, and me, but me to a lesser extent, because he is the star of the show this morning, put him to the test and let's see um, if we can offer um, hope for South Africa. So, John, first question. Um, this policy paper, um, why do you think it is a policy paper worth listening to, worth reading? Is it any different from any of the countless plans and strategies that we've seen published not only recently, but over the last 10 years, every one of them promising something new, promising prosperity, promising growth. I do think that this paper is different uh, to the other ones that we've seen. Um, as you mentioned earlier, this paper is based on an earlier paper from 2016 that uh, made very sensible proposals, which we retain in this updated version of the paper. And those proposals, I think, were pretty much ignored at the time. Um, and instead, the government uh, pursued other policy initiatives, which were very similar to the ones that it has been pursuing for the past decade or longer. And these initiatives are usually based on uh, stimulus spending, so getting the state to spend lots of money on infrastructure, on other things, uh, on pursuing the green economy, on having uh, grandiose schemes, like, for example, a Black Industrialists Programme. Uh, which are ideas that consume a lot of money but produce very little output. And consistent failure of these plans over the last decade at, la at least is due not only to the fact that implementation has been lacking, which is the factor that's mostly pointed out. Uh, people always say we're great at plans, but when it comes to execution, we don't do so well. And that is certainly true. But we think that there's another reason why these plans are failing and have failed, and that is that they do not address the underlying ideology that uh, represents a huge break and impediment to the ability of ordinary South Africans to get the economy to grow through their own efforts. Now, the Institute um, is often uh, ideologically uh, pigeonholed, um, sometimes uh, unfairly, sometimes fairly, sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly to uh, various extents. But I think what might be striking about this specific document is that it does not seek to be overtly um, either right of the economic spectrum or left of the economic spectrum, because if I understand correctly, it also addresses uh, a crucial issue in South Africa as to social welfare and social welfare support. Now, how could we at the same time advocate free market policies um, that I think has delivered uh, where they've been tried, even in South Africa, but simultaneously also um, make uh, um, acknowledgement, at least, of the necessity for some form of a welfare and a successful and a stable uh, welfare support structure. I think this is a good point and probably something that will be quite unexpected for uh, many public commentators who have a certain image of the um, IRR. But in this paper, we do say that the, the social welfare system that South Africa has built over the past years is a, one that works very effectively and also at a pretty low cost. Um, and the reason for that is that the benefits of the social welfare are delivered directly to the recipients. Um, and there's no intermediary in between the funds being uh, passed from the government to individuals, but rather that they the funds are put directly into the hands of individuals, and that makes it work well. Um, our libertarian friends, I think, would argue for, for far more deregulation and a scaling back of the state than we do in this paper. But our impression is that the um, scale of 
destitution and deprivation in South Africa so extensive that to leave people without any support at all would be um, quite callous. And we think that you know, social welfare should be maintained. We do see a great risk in its affordability. So, uh, it consumes a larger and larger part and, um, and tax revenues aren't increasing fast enough. So in other words, you know, even if the, the wish and the desire to maintain so social welfare is there, the ability to keep affording it might soon not be. And there was a, a statistic that came out, I think, during the lockdown, that about 70% of all tax revenue gets spent on uh, salaries of government employees and interest payments on our debt. And as our debt increases, the money we have to pay in interest to the people who loaned it to us increases as well. And it squeezes the space left for investments in infrastructure, in social welfare, in education, in healthcare, and these very, very important state activities. So, uh, focusing in on the idea of sustainability and affordability, um, you mentioned in, in this paper that one of its uh, unique elements almost, or one of its unique selling points, is the fact that it doesn't call for massive government expenditure, that it is in fact uh, not, not only, we think, a very practical plan uh, relying on proven track records and experiments of economic policy and success, but that it is also affordable in that it demands actually very little in terms of financial input uh, from government. Now, that seems to fly in the face of every single plan that the government has published over the last 10 years. That's right. Um, so most of the government plans and also the, the plan of the Business for South Africa Alliance that was published in July call for very large amounts of spending on infrastructure, especially amounting to hundreds of billions or even trillions of rands. And it is hard to imagine the scale of the spending. That if the, the numbers are incomprehensible. But they are even more difficult to understand if you put them in relation to um, the deficit and the lack of uh, funding that we already have in South Africa. So to consider spending such vast amounts of money at a time when government revenue is lacking, I think uh, really beggars belief. And what we are trying to do with our plan is to make proposals that could be implemented at almost no financial cost. So. Having, having, I think, relatively established that firstly, it is it is not an overtly ideological plan. It is, uh, of course, a plan that depends on certain free market principles, but certain principles that the ANC themselves have endorsed um, in the past to their own um, uh, political and electoral um, benefit. But that is so. It's it's as far as I can understand, not overtly ideological. It does incorporate a, a rather centrist um, and, and uh, um, consensus-seeking approach, but it is also relatively cheap. And um, it, that, that during this time of fiscal constraints, that surely is something that, that counts in its favor. So let's dive into the nitty-gritty of the plan. Um, it is based on four basic steps. Um, that the paper says are uh, consecutive and uh, building towards a GDP growth rate of possibly 7% GDP within the next decade, um, if this plan is fully implemented. Perhaps you can take us through those four steps. Okay, and maybe after that we can get to the three uh, bitter, bitter pills that we hide inside the paper, which we think are really, really necessary. Um, but the, the, the four steps are quite simple, and I think most people would agree with them. The underlying idea is that in order to get out of the hole that we're in, what we really need is economic growth. We need to achieve high levels of economic growth in order to increase prosperity and reduce unemployment and uh, get the country into a more positive uh, state of mind as well. I think currently there is a sense of despondency and helplessness in South Africa, where people can see that they've been getting poorer for the past five years at least um, on a per capita basis, 
they can see their prospects dwindling um, and there doesn't seem to be much that individuals can do about it and the state doesn't seem to be doing the right things to change this trajectory. So what we're saying is that we do need economic growth and what that relies on is four things. The first one is that we need to attract direct investment, both locally and, and foreign investment. And we think that currently the investment climate is hostile in South Africa. There are a number of um, policy proposals and policies, existing policies in South Africa, that make South Africa an unattractive destination for international investors. And as I said, local investors as well, who in many cases are choosing to put their funds overseas because they feel that their investments in South Africa are not generating enough um, yields um, and are, as a matter of fact, maybe not safe. Now, that is a very, very important point. Secondly, um, we call for um, better maintenance and also the expansion of infrastructure. And this is another point where we do align with the other plans that have been published. The reason why we think this is important is because infrastructure is the tool that allows you to be productive. In other words, if you're on a farm somewhere, for example, and you haven't got a road or a rail or any you know, link to the outside world near your farm, then it's no good you producing lots of food. You need to get it to the market. And to get it to the market, you need infrastructure. And that you know, extends across the various fields of infrastructure, from transport to communication, to everything that's needed to uh, support business and also individuals in their efforts to be productive. The third element is that we want to create a climate that is favorable to job creation. At the moment, we think that uh, companies are desisting from employing people um, because of policy and because of uncertainty about their own economic prospects and the prospects of the country. And so the rate at which jobs are created has slowed down to a trickle and it's not enough to make an, an uh, impact on the very, very high levels of unemployment we've got at the moment. We've got to change that. We need to get people into work. And then lastly, what we are proposing is that uh, 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 schemes like black economic empowerment be scrapped and replaced with true economic empowerment because it is undeniable that there is great suffering in South Africa. Uh, every time you drive past a robot and there's a man begging, begging there, think about that man as being your father or your brother. You know, it's uh, really not a good thing and we need to change this. We must give people a chance to earn an income and get out of that situation. It's, it's appalling what's happening at the moment. Um, and what we're proposing in terms of true economic empowerment is relieving companies of the burden of complying with, complying with BEE, which we think uh, imposes an overhead cost that limits their productivity and efficiency, that opens the doors to corruption and inefficiency, um, and that drags the whole country down. What we should think should happen instead is that on an individual basis, um, people who are disadvantaged, and there are many in South Africa, should be given um, resources by the state in the form of a direct transfer of economic value, vouchers, for example, where we say, um, if your income is low and you have children, we will give you vouchers worth a certain amount of rands per year or per month, and you can spend those where you like. In other words, the government continues to pay for things like education and healthcare and housing, but it does not execute on it. We would much rather have people decide where they put their money by using vouchers and uh, spending them either, either with private providers or state institutions if those are well run. And we think that the competition this would introduce into the market and the sense of choice and power it would give individuals would make a great difference to how monies are spent uh, and to making sure that they, they get to the right place. And underlying this is the idea of subsidiarity, which is a concept that says we should put decision-making power as close as possible to the place where the effect of those decisions is felt. And parents, for example, when deciding over their, their children's education, should have the power to make that decision, which they currently don't have. And they should be given the financial resources to put um, some impact behind that decision making as well. Now, the the matter of subsidiarity is I is 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 I think very interesting and and um, it, to my mind it translates to this idea of skin in the game. There's a uh, the, the people who who feel the effects of decision should 
be the people making those decisions. And I think there is an uh, insularity in South African politics um, where um, there is some uh, lack of connection between the effects of policy decisions and those people who make it. But those people who make it, um, the SACP, ANC government, um, they have a, they they are unlikely um, to adopt a plan or a policy direction uh, contrary to their ideology. Now, do you think um, historically and perhaps even currently that the ANC has some form of um, political pragmatism that it can rely on to understand that if they don't swallow these bitter pills, um, they might fall victim to a much, much more threatened political and ideological inconvenience. I think that um, the ideology under underlying the ANC's and SACP's policies is, is very deeply tied to the sense of identity of these organizations. And the, the ideology is, is one of centralization um, and uh, allowing uh, people to help others through their power and their resources. And I think it will be very, very difficult to get the ANC and SACP to move away from this. This will only happen if the sense of threat from the alternative is great enough to cause uh, separation from these harmful ideas. But currently, certainly, the thinking is still that um, you know, if things go wrong in the country, education, healthcare, or the municipalities, the, the response should be to centralize power in the central government, which will then sort out these problems and somehow resolve and fix them. And what it displays is a, a lack of trust, I think, in the ability of South Africans to make good decisions and to, to take charge of their own lives. And the results so far have been very clear, which is that centralization has not helped. It has not helped to reduce um, poverty, it has not helped to reduce unemployment. It has not even helped to, I think, uh, strengthen the ANC's position in society. Uh, originally, the intention of policies like aided deployment was to ensure that the ANC would have the power uh, to, to stay, uh, to remain in power for a long time and to implement its decisions and its policies. But what's happened, in fact, in fact is that often the underperformance is so severe that people turn away from the ANC in anger and disgust. Uh, we see service delivery protests, we see great unhappiness. And I think this is actually directly linked to the centralizing instinct of the ANC. And what needs to happen is to say, um, we accept that nobody's all knowing, not even the ANC government, and uh, people themselves must be allowed to make decisions. And as you alluded to earlier, when we spoke before this briefing, this includes the, the, the right to make mistakes. Um, but it's much better for individuals to make mistakes, for some individuals to make mistakes, than, to, than for one government to make mistakes on behalf of 50 or 60 million South Africans. That's much more dangerous. So um, the paper also uh, addresses, or, or at least uh, mentions, uh, the, the development recently with the IMF, where we as the IRR have been uh, quite uh, gratified uh, that um, our two-month-long campaign of engaging with IMF donor nations at all levels, from diplomatic all the way to government ministers, uh, really delivered in, in, in a sense that the um, IMF's statement and, and warning of policy um, implications and policy uh, a necessary policy change really is almost unique. Um, I've looked at all the other countries uh, recently that received similar assistance from the IMF, and it really is telling that South Africa is in a way singled out to be issued with a warning of um, what might happen if, in the words of the IMF, growth enhancing structural reforms are not implemented. So. The fact that the government has now gone to the IMF um, really shows uh, that whether they have um, uh, imposed on themselves a pragmatic policy or whether 
it would be imposed from outside the ANC and perhaps even outside the country, the ANC has really governed itself into a corner. Yeah, well, that's actually uh, absolutely right. You know, so for a long time, it was a, a taboo within the ANC and SACP for the South African government to take loans from the international finance institutions because these loans typically come with conditions attached. So they signify a certain giving up of sovereignty. Uh, as a government, you're not completely free in the decisions you're able to make. You have to um, allow your decisions to be guided by an outside agency, and that is you know, very unpleasant. Nobody wants that. You want to be able to make your own decisions. And the fact that the um, government has now actually approached several of these organizations for loans and received them, I think represents a very important development and it was a taboo that was broken. And I think once a taboo is broken, it's easy to break it again. And I think that these loans, which we've seen so far, um, which have not been um, extraordinarily large, will not be the last loans. I do suspect that the government will need to go back to the IMF for more loans before long. And I think that those future loans will come with much more severe conditions attached than this first tranche has been. Um, and, and from an institutional point of view, that's that's very encouraging because um, uh, it gives organizations like the IRR a, a new uh, tool or mechanism of accountability and of pressure and of change that didn't exist a month ago or even 10 years ago. So there, there is some, some uh, uh, hope in that um, uh, delinquent pragmatism that the ANC uh, might have now um, adopted by sheer necessity. But um, I can, I can, being uh, employees for, for, for a policy think tank, I can, I can only uh, imagine that people um, listening at home, people worried about um, the basics and, uh, of, of life, where, where my child will go to school, where my next meal will come from, will I have a home, will I keep my job, will I have an income? And while our policy discussions, I think, are very interesting and should form the basis for decision making, let's make it granular, let's, let's, let's make it tangible. For the ordinary South African, what does this policy document offer that other policy uh, options or strategies simply do not. Well, maybe now is a good time to come to the three bitter pills which we propose, because these are things that we haven't seen in the other strategies that have been proposed. And we think those are glaring emissions, because these are, are factors that are going to prevent the other plans from working. And no matter how much money you, you throw at it, and how much, no matter how much you talk about social compacts, and the desire to grow and you know, fight the triple evils of inequality, poverty, and joblessness, these plans will not work. And the reason for that is that the ideology, ideological orientation is problematic. And so the three bitter pills we call for are firstly, a firm commitment to property rights. We think that you cannot attract investment, either foreign or local, if there is a question mark over the sanctity of property rights in your country. And the ANC is pursuing policies that put exactly that uh, under question in terms of expropriation without compensation of land and related assets, in terms of the monopolization and de facto expropriation of the healthcare sector through a, a monopolistic government-run national, uh, national health insurance scheme. Um, and then, of course, also the, the government's discussion of prescribed assets, a proposal to use um, people's pension savings effectively to fund infrastructure spending or to um, bail out SOEs. And I know that the, the communication from the government is all over the place on this question at the moment. So uh, I think Minister, or oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Inok Gonogwana just came out saying that you know it's not true that they're planning to use pensions to bail out SAEs. It's only meant for, for infrastructure with attractive returns. But given the track record of the ANC, I, you know, I just don't think that's true. I think if your pension money gets forced to be used for infrastructure spending, you're going to lose returns. You'll have less money to retire on by the time you reach retirement age. 
And so you know, these plans have to be abandoned. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's no way around it. I don't think you can soften it or ring fence it or say, and we'll just do a little bit of expropriation. We'll make sure you know, that nothing happens to you. It'll only happen to other people. It doesn't work that way. You know, once you start, you start meddling with, with property rights, you really, you're meddling with the existence of a market economy, the thing that generates wealth. So you, you've got to stop doing that. The second bitter pill is race-based policies. So we, we, we understand where it's coming from. You know, it's the idea of creating redress for the past and making sure that people who were previously disadvantaged under the apartheid regime um, now have a better opportunity uh, to make a good life for themselves. But here, I think that the ineffectiveness of the policies so far um, associated with the, the, the misguided approach that they pursue means that they should be scrapped. Um, currently, BE policies are creating a new elite. I think you know, that's, that's indisputable. And it is the elite that benefits from these policies. You know? So if, if you have a good education and you're black, then you'll find out about tenders and you'll find ways to apply for tenders. And you'll get tenders before, because you're black or because you're well connected. But you know, 85% of the people will never find out about those tenders, won't be able to apply for them and won't benefit from them. Um, it opens the door to corruption. Um, it doesn't create widespread benefits. And we think that the focus needs to be moved away from um, skin color and towards disadvantage and saying, look, we've got you know, so many millions of people out of work in South Africa. So many millions of people who don't know where the next meal is going to come from, who are poor. And we, this, you know, we really need to do something about this, but we need to find a way that works. Um, and we, we think there are better ways of doing it, which we, which we promote through um, our policy of economic empowerment for the disadvantaged and through the proposal to um, create a meritocratic civil service and also to remove race as a basis for uh, preference and procurement. All of these things have been turned out to be very, very expensive and have created um, and created a front a cover for widespread corruption. The third bitter pill is liberalization of markets and especially of the labor market. So again, it's very noble of the unions to call for decent wages and decent jobs, but we have so many unemployed people in South Africa who are prevented from getting any work by policies such as the minimum wage, for example, and other policies that uh, protect insiders, but prevent outsiders from getting into the job market. And these policies need to be reviewed to make it possible for people to find jobs. So I, I, I think I, I can, of course, buy into, into those things um, quite easily. And I, I, I agree with, your four, with the four stated ambitions, the first one being to attract investment. Um, the second one, I think, is infrastructure development and expansion. And you mentioned tenders. Uh, now, what does the report offer in terms of addressing these issues of um, badly built infrastructure, unbuilt infrastructure, neglected infrastructure? Um, and, and, and how does this differ uh, or the recommendations differ from the government's uh, recommendations to spend, to spend billions and billions of rands um, on developing infrastructure? I think there's, there is an overlap in that area between our plans and the government's. You know, we, we recognize the need for infrastructure and for maintenance and expansion. But we do think that the way um, infrastructure spend is being handled at the moment, for example, on a, on a racial procurement basis, uh, it just creates huge inefficiency and allows substandard work to pass. And, you know, this is something we we see in many sectors of the economy. You know, if you think of the construction mafias in, that started in KwaZulu Natal and have now spread to other parts of the country, there are effectively you know, groups of thugs stopping infrastructure projects uh, and saying that they want a 30% stake in that project because um, of BE, you know, because of local procurement requirements and so on. I think there's mostly a made up reason, but you know, it, it, it is like a smokescreen. It is something that allows this argument to be made credibly. And that is very, very harmful. You know? 
infrastructure really should be done purely on meritocratic basis. Um, you know, if you build a bridge, the only thing that matters is can it be delivered on time, on spec, and won't it fall maybe, <laughs> while making sure that it doesn't fall down after a few years of use. So we think there should be greater participation of the private sector in infrastructure, and also the racial procurement element should fall away. This needs to be uh, based purely on price, quality, and ability to deliver. Now, um, isn't uh, let, let me play devil's advocate for a moment here. You say that the private sector should become involved uh, in, in this. Isn't um, prescribed assets exactly that, to the government involving the private sector uh, in, in the funding of, uh, of, of, of public infrastructure? Yes. So um, there, there's a, a giveaway in the word prescribed. So in other words, I think if, if it were on a voluntary basis, um, you know, if, if government said, look, pension fund managers, we've got some projects going which we think will have good returns, and you are free to invest in these if you think it's good for um, the people who contributed to your fund, then absolutely, I think it's a good idea. You know, and maybe that argument can be made. Maybe the government is able to, to generate some infrastructure spending plans and credibly say that these will generate a return from which um, you know, pension funds will benefit in the, um, financially. But the problem is the word prescribed. In other words, if the government says, we do not give you a choice, we will force you to give a certain percentage of your funds under management to us for infrastructure spending, then it's a problem. Because I think, you know, then you have to assume that because they weren't able to attract the investment on commercial grounds, those uh, investments are not commercially viable. And that means a loss for the, for the, the holders of those pension funds. So um, are, we, are we then calling for a whole scale privatization of every inch of road and every molecule um, of, of uh, public, you know, infrastructure, schools, hospitals, roads, bridges. No, we're not not, not doing quite that. And so there, there are, you know, several different models of, of how you can partner um, the private sector with the public sector. Um, for example, you know, the the, the um, public sector can, for example, order certain uh, infrastructure components uh, from the private sector. Um, and you know, buy them on a commercial basis. It can also um, contract with the private sector to operate infrastructure, as we saw, for example, with toll roads. You know, the, those toll roads, which were uh, built and maintained and operated by toll road consortiums, worked very, very well. You know, the quality of the roads is great. Um, the maintenance is good. There's a, a service that cleans up debris on the roads, and it just works very, very well. And um, I think that is that is what we should pursue. You know, with um, areas where the private sector is strong are areas where the private sector should be brought in and it should be you know, on a contract basis, should be uh, given a contract to achieve certain deliverables and then you know you manage the contract. You make sure you get the deliverables and then it's, it's, it's all good. And then moving on to point three, which I think is the focus on job creation. Um, the tourism industry in South Africa is currently under, uh, I, I think strain would be a polite way of putting it, I think some of them might say they're under attack um, from a very antagonistic government, especially during this time of crisis that has, um, I think, acted quite appallingly um, towards a sector that, uh, according to our analysis, can actually provide massive opportunities simply due to the nature of the work, due to the fact that unskilled or low-skilled workers um, uh, could very easily get their first step on the job experience and income ladder through that sector. Mm. Now, we, we, we single out three sectors which we think would be good for, for job creation, um, of which tourism is one, and as you as you rightly point out, that sector is under a great deal of strain at the moment, um, partly because it's been prevented from operating, like the rest of the economy from 27th of March, but then for even longer than the rest of the economy, you know, which was gradually allowed to reopen, um, 
it, it's been inhibited by by prohibitions on being allowed to to offer its services for a very long stretch of time. And when it comes to international travel, of course, that is still banned. So you know, all the, the high paying dollar tourists aren't coming. You know, they've they've cancelled all their plans for this year, and who knows what will happen next. So we we understand that the government wants to protect lives and prevent you know, coronavirus from being re-imported into South Africa. Um, but it, uh, something needs to be done for the tourism sector, I think. And uh, I think there, the uh, climate can be quite hostile, as we saw when you know, these relief funds were being offered by the tourism minister um, on a racial basis. Um, and we think that makes no sense at all, you know, because you know, many tourism businesses, even if they are owned by white owners, employ black staff. And by... Uh, Allowing them to go under without a life ring, um, you are you are condemning the employees as well as the owners to potential oblivion, and um, yeah, that's that's not a good idea. So practically, uh, what would help the tourism uh, industry or the tourism sector from this plan? Um, from this plan, what we're um, well, one of the things what actually that actually would help is uh, investments in infrastructure. Um, so, in, especially in rural areas, I think we see infrastructure declining very fast. We're seeing rail infrastructure being dismantled and sold off for scrap. So, you know, railways are under, under pressure, roads are in bad repair, um, the water infrastructure is, is collapsing in many areas, electricity as well, and all of these things impact on tourism. Uh, if you, so an American or a German who comes to South Africa for safari for two weeks, now, you're not going to have a favorable impression if you can't drink the tap water. Uh, you've got, you know, daily load shedding. <laughs> the roads are bumpy. You keep um, having flat tires and so on. So, yeah, you know, that, that needs to be fixed for tourism to work. All of these things link into, link into one another. You know, an economy is not, it's not like an assembly of distinct parts that don't talk to each other. It's all linked together. And so if mm -hmm. you want to get going, you need to fix the various, the various components at the same time. So then... In this policy proposal, uh, it, it, it's, it's from, from my reading of it, it, it really translates into things that government should stop doing rather than things broadly that government should start doing. And two of the things they should stop doing is uh, scrap BEE, and I think we've delved into that uh, quite sufficiently. But in terms of the minimum wage, um, how would you answer an accusation that, look, the Institute of Race Relations only cares about the white middle class, they don't care about decent levels of income to the poorest, that is why they want to scrap the minimum wage? Mm. Well, my, my reply to that would be, which is worse, earning a very low income or earning no income at all? And this is effectively really what the minimum wage does. It says, you know, if you cannot reach an agreement with a, a potential employer on a price that is acceptable to the government, then you are not allowed to work. You will have to sit at home. And I think you know that's that's an even worse outcome than earning a, a low wage. The point about the low wage is not only that um, it's it's not having a job is not only about the income. It's not only about the money which you earn. It's also about um, having the opportunity to uh, improve from there on. You know, by working, you gain experience, you meet people in the course of work, you discover what you're doing, you might be impressed by what you're doing. And so you've got the potential of stepping up from a low paid job into a better paid job. But you have to get into the job at the first, you know, in the first instance, you can't get past that step. And by locking people out of the labor market, you're preventing them from having that opportunity of building experience, of building networks, of showing their worth, and of working their way up. And I think that's that for me is the strongest argument against a minimum wage. A last question for me before I will throw it open uh, to questions uh, that I've been uh, sent uh, via WhatsApp and questions uh, that that might come from from uh, journalists in attendance. Um, we deliberately um, chose a succession of, as it were, publications. Uh, a few weeks ago, we published. Uh, a, a short documentary, a uh, 20 minute documentary that I really urge everyone uh, to to have a look at on the IRR's Facebook page. 
uh, and on on YouTube, where um, myself, uh, Sitlin Gubese and Gabriel Crozer, two of my colleagues, uh, two of our colleagues actually, um, spoke to ordinary South Africans, small business owners, informal traders, taxi owners, uh, the, the whole range uh, from very informal, very small to formal, um, medium-sized, solid established businesses uh, about the economic uh, climate they faced and the challenges that lockdown posed to them. So we deliberately went about to first diagnose the problem um, but not just diagnose it in terms of um, dispassionately observing data, but going out there and following, I think, Helen Sisman's very great advice of going to see for yourself what's going on in the country. And I mean, that that was a very, very impactful experience for me, not only making being part of the process that made the documentary, but also watching it. And I've watched quite a few times now. Um, and we pay homage um, in this report and specifically on the cover of this report to those people that we spoke to, um, to those business owners facing difficult circumstances, telling us what they need, telling us how they can get back on their feet, how they can re-employ or continue employing their staff and protecting lives and Hi, livelihoods I'm Brad Callen. And um, from the, you know, the, the pandemic of poverty, which is, of course, another pandemic that is incredibly dangerous and possibly even more dangerous than this current um, uh, COVID-19 situation we face. You close off the, the document with uh, an, an interesting uh, argument, uh, a call to hope, as it were, a call to a national mood. Um, as a last question for me, why, 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 why do you do that? Why is, um, why do you make policy an almost emotional, emotive, national mood kind of conversation? Well, um, economics, I think, used to be based on this idea of the, the rational man, you know, homo economicus. But of course, people are emotional, you know, and, and that does affect the economy as well. Um, the way we feel um, determines our causes of actions often. And I think when, when people feel very uncertain and scared um, and lacking in hope, they will not uh, think of expanding their prospects. They rather think of protecting what they've got. And so, you know, for a number of years now, we've seen this in so-called investment strike by the private sector. In reality, investment by the public sector has also been low. And I think this is reflective of a, of a lack of, of, uh, of trust in the future. And this is a, an opportunity for South Africa, I think, to turn around its fortunes pretty quickly. But if we manage to turn around the mood, but not based on exhortations, you know, and based on nice speeches and nice words by politicians, which are not enough. You know, I, I think politicians also want to turn sentiment around. Now, Ramaphosa was trying to do it with, with the uh, investment summits. But it's not good enough. You, know, you, you can't talk yourself out of trouble. You have to do something about it. Um, and I think that the reforms which we propose, if they were to be implemented, could turn around the sentiment very quickly in the economy. And they could also uh, change the way that South Africa sees itself in the world. And it could change the way in which the world sees South Africa, not as a, a state that is on the de decline, which is what we are at the moment. You know, we're, we're certainly not, not improving from year to year. We're getting worse from year to year. And nobody wants to invest in a country like that. Like that, but if there were a credible plan that says, you know, we we do have a way of turning things around, of getting better, I think that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. We attract more investment, more interest, more optimism, and the economy will grow on the back of that. And that is a huge opportunity for the country. Also, against the backdrop of um, global stimulus programs. You know, which the, the world's rich countries are currently implementing. There's a lot of liquidity in the markets. There's a lot of money looking for places to go to. And it's going to go to places where it can get returns. So if we, as South Africa, as a country, can create a narrative where we say, this is where you can get returns in a world of low returns. This is where you can get good returns. Money will come. And I think that will help with the infrastructure expansion as well.
we won't have to rely so much on loans if we can make an argument to investors that their investments will create strong returns in this country. Excellent. Um, so um, that brings my questions to a close. Um, now, um, I have one or two questions that have been uh, WhatsApp to me, but before I ask those from journalists, um, our journalist friends in attendance, please feel free to use the chat function in Teams. Uh, if you move your mouse over the screen, the little bar should appear about a fifth of the way down uh, or up from the bottom of the screen and to the right, there's a hang up button. Don't click on that one yet. Then there's a little uh, icon that is about show participants and then to its left, there's a little speech bubble um, and you can use the speech bubble to um, alert uh, me to the fact that you would like to um, ask a question. Um, you can either uh, type out the question or you can uh, um, just indicate that you want to ask a question. I will hand over the, as it were, the digital mic to you. So uh, any journalists uh, wishing to ask a question, uh, please make use of that chat function. Uh, now, I will now ask uh, just these two questions uh, that that's been WhatsApped uh, to me. The first question is the policy paper um, sets a high ambition of 7% GDP growth within the next decade. What impact would the energy constraints on the South African economy play on that ambition? Yeah, this is, this is something we mentioned in se several points in the paper, and that, that is also a very good point, which is that I think that the energy constraint imposes a hard cap on our ability to grow. As long as we can't generate enough electricity and also not generate electricity reliably, we will not be able to grow the economy. So that is really something that needs to be attended to with very great urgency by the government, which we're not seeing at this stage. And um, I think the way to attend to it is twofold. Um, one is to open up the generation market to private production, um, which currently you know, is uh, subject to severe constraints, regulatory constraints, but I think which would allow the, the very rapid expansion of generation um, if, if private actors were allowed to, to enter the market. And the, the second argument is one I saw made um, by an energy expert um, on social media who suggests that currently our plant are old and failing a lot because of lack of maintenance over recent years. And what should be done is that when there are multiple units within one plant, like multiple boilers, for example, a certain number of those boilers should be shut down permanently, accepting that they will not be used anymore. And they should be cannibalized to make sure that the remaining boilers run smoothly and properly without failing. And that would create, I think, a lot of certainty in supply. Um, it would let us know that we have less supply than we thought we had, but it would be reliable supply. And I think that would be very, very important. So yeah, ESCOM is a hugely important question for the economy. Uh, second question, um, doesn't this plan risk failing black South Africans in the sense that it seems to be mute on the issue of redress? Well, it's been a quarter century since the end of apartheid. Um, and we know that the legal barriers to the advancement of black people in South Africa have been removed. There were very great impediments before that during apartheid, as we all know. And these impediments have been removed. We've also seen attempts to um, do more than just remove impediments and to help black people advance in South Africa through BE policies and redress policies. But we believe that the effect of these policies has been insufficient in moving very large numbers of poor people out of poverty. And we think that these policies are in fact a barrier to that happening. So we would say that if we want proper redress and you know, we want to to give everybody a fighting chance in South Africa, we need to give them a fighting chance based on, on colorblind policies, effectively, accepting that there might be some poor white people who also benefit, and also accepting that there might be some wealthy black people who will not benefit. But we think ultimately, you know, the, the people who need to be helped to become prosperous are those who are poor. Um, to a very large extent, that overlaps with, with those who are black, of course. But um, 
we think that a clearer focus there will help a lot more than what we're doing at the moment. Um, there's a follow-up question, um, and I will take a stab at giving a bit of an answer, but then I will give it over to you as well. Um, and just just a, 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 a mention to to uh, journalists in attendance. Um, I'm, I'm happy with WhatsApp questions, but please, uh, if you uh, if you would like to ask a question, anyone who hasn't WhatsApp me a question, the the chat option is there, and I will somehow now ask um, my colleague Alex uh, Vice to in the chat function um, share a link to the report um, so that that report can be you know easily downloaded uh, at your convenience. Um, so then, the follow up question is about the land issue. Um, the Institute of Race Relations um, uh, has very strong opinions on property rights, and this document reinforces those opinions. But doesn't this again fail black people in that it doesn't address the land issue explicitly? Now, let me take a, a stab at that firstly. Um, I, I think um, this policy document has, has a focus on, 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 on a broad economic um, uh, 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 plan and it touches on the issue of property rights, of course. Uh, I would urge, however, journalists to look at the two proposals that we published at the end of last year, the Ipulazi proposal and the Inlu proposal. Um, if the Ipulazi proposal really is the IRR's answer to rural uh, land issues and how um, rural land can be reinvigorated in a, in a, in a positive uh, sense to um, speak to the issue of land, but also to um, buttress uh, real economic progress for South Africans. The INLU proposal is in terms of urban land with more of a focus on housing. So I would urge people to to look at those uh, proposals on the IRR website. Uh, but John, uh, uh, land um, in, in this uh, policy proposal, um, is, is it a blind spot for us? Are we, are we missing something fundamentally here? Um, we don't raise it in this paper. I think we do in others. Um, and the, the point I think would be that, you know, we, number one, we're very much in favor of land restitution. So, you know, where, where people were dispossessed of their land, um, either the, the state, that land must be returned to them. And I think, you know, there, there has been an ongoing process driven by the government on this topic with mixed success, um, but that is something that must be done. The second question is the question of land redistribution. And I think that's, you know, that's where you, where it becomes a bit more tricky. Um, and I think that there is, um, especially in, in urban areas, certainly a need for uh, residential land for residential reasons. Um, and here we think that the the government does have a role to play in making sure that people have access to land, but we think that property owners should not be deprived without compensation of their property. Um, and the reason for that is that property that is potentially subject to expropriation without compensation, loses a very large amount of its value. And what we want is that when land gets transferred and people you know, receive land, it should be valuable for them. It should not be a valueless asset. And for it to be valued and valuable, um, property rights have to be strong. You know, people need to have title over their, over their property and they need to have the ability to um, defend that title and be sure that it's not going to be subject to expropriation by any further, any future government or the current government. So that, I think, is the, the point I would make, is that, you know, yes, land restitution has to happen, redistribution, yes, but it has to be on the basis of strong property rights. Um, maybe also bringing in there the um, communal property associations and tribal lands. Um, we, we think that it is not good to have unclear property relations in, in rural areas. We think that people are being deprived of a large part of the value of the land by being deprived of the ability to own it outright. I think we have time for one last question or perhaps two. Um, a guest of ours, uh, Marcel, um, has mentioned here in the chat function that he would like to ask a question. Uh, Marcel, feel free to uh, unmute yourself 
and uh, yeah. put your question. Can you hear me? Yes, Marcel, hello. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Marcel Gascon. I'm from Spain and I, I'm a freelance journalist. I lived in South Africa for a while, for six years, and I would, uh, I'm very interested in your plan. And I would like to ask you if you, if, if you think that the, um, the current crisis, it's quite a brutal crisis because of the lockdown, and it has worsened the economic situation in South Africa, which was not good already. Do you think it's an opportunity for the opinion makers to realize, to, to open their eyes to, to the importance of not only eradicating corruption, but, to, but also to remove the obstacles to economic freedom? Because we need, we need growth more than ever. And I think it can be a good opportunity to, to put that in the middle of the conversation and not only talk about corruption. And do you think, are you perceiving any change in that direction? Are you perceiving that more people is realizing how important it is to, to free the economy of, of all these obstacles, especially when, when, the, when the, the centralized, uh, how do you say, the centralized approach that has been taken so far has failed? Marcelo, I think you know, it, it, you're right, it is an opportunity. Um, times of crisis are always times of opportunity. I think the, the ANC, SACP, is also see, seeing this as a time of opportunity. But unfortunately, they're going back to their ideological roots. And so the proposals they're making um, argue in favor of greater centralization rather than less. You know, we've got the, the National Corona Command Council, a very centralized uh, decision-making body during this crisis, subject to very little oversight, um, is a, a centralizing um, a, a approach to solving a problem. And the policy document of the ANC also proposes extending this approach further across the country. So, you know, they say there should be lots of command councils, and all of these command councils should then, you know, in a very benevolent fa fashion and very competently administer the uh, affairs of the, of the state in a much better way than has been done to date. So at the moment, I would say there's, there's not really a, a sign of a shift in the government in terms of ideology, but I do wonder whether there isn't a sign of a shift um, in South Africa's people. So over the last three weeks especially, we've seen a, a very large uh, amount of dissatisfaction expressed with the ANC on social media, and we think that the ANC has perceived this. So we've suddenly seen a flurry of announcements by senior leaders admitting and acknowledging that there has been a lot of corruption and inefficiency and incompetence in, in state administration. Um, so that maybe is a, a chink in the armor and a first step towards changes, um, but it really hinges on the question of, of what the response is. Is the response to centralize more in order to fix these perceived problems, or is it to centralize less and let, let go of power um, to see if we can, can get on an upward trajectory? Thank you, John. Marshall, uh, I, I hope I have not offended by muting you again. Uh, so I thought it would be courteous just to ask whether, whether you have a follow-up question. Um, I just thought that I should mention that if you have a follow-up question and you are asking it now, we might not be aware of it. Good. Uh, it seems that Marshall is, is, is happy with his allotted freedom. Um, John, thank you so much for your time uh, this morning. Uh, perhaps, uh, oh, I see Marcel has unmuted himself. Marcel, uh, please feel free to follow, uh, to ask a follow-up question uh, if you want to. No, I was trying to mute myself. So <laughs> you, I let you mute myself. So, so you can do it and then we are fine. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, um, John, uh, thank you very much for, for your time this morning. Um, uh, I think it has been uh, very interesting uh, to, to discuss really the realities of, of what such a plan uh, can mean. Perhaps uh, before I, I conclude, I could give you a, a last word. Mm. What I would like to say in conclusion is that I'm, I'm very angry. And I think many South Africans are very angry. And uh, we, we have reasons to be angry because um, yeah, our, our lives are not going the way they should be. And I think it's, it's, it's time for that to change. And I hope that we're able to translate this anger into action. Um, and I'd just like to also acknowledge and recognize all the colleagues at the IRR who work very, very hard to you know, do exactly this, to create better futures for all South Africans. Um, so thank you all for, for that. And let's keep up the good fight.
Thank you, John. And I, I, I do think a special thanks should go out to the friends of the IRR, uh, the people who with their monthly donations, whether it's 20 rand, whether it's more than that, um, support the work we do. Um, I'm often asked, what, what does the Institute of Race Relations actually do? And I think um, it's a very important question at a very important time. And I've been trying to get a good, to a good answer to that. And I think one of the best answers that I could possibly give is that South Africa um, is suffering from a very dangerous disease and that there are many, many symptoms and that South Africa has a potent and vibrant civil society that has over the last century become very efficient at dealing with the symptoms um, of this disease, but that there is also a question of actually cutting out the tumor, the, the cancerous uh, growth that is really stifling the potential of this country. And while the Institute of Race Relations might not always make people feel better, we are not always focused on symptomatic treatment, but what we at the Institute can promise our friends and the people of South Africa is that we do not for a moment ease up on seeking to eradicate the real disease. It is important that the pain of this disease gets treatment and gets relief, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that symptomatic treatment is not enough to get South Africa through the hard times and to where we should be. And I can just thank the Institute's friends for making this a possibility that an organization can commit itself to the unglamorous work of coming up with treatments that don't necessarily um, have the symptomatic relief of um, more short-term solutions, but that we can devote our time to really digging deep and getting fundamental solutions to fundamental problems. For that, we really cannot thank you enough. Thank you uh, for everyone who joined us this morning. Um, please keep an eye on our media appearances over, over coming days where we will seek to build on the arguments John presented this morning and really influence the discussion positively to make sure that we can, as the presidency tweeted out a few days ago, hashtag grow South Africa. And we can only do that if we have true growth, true recovery, and if we get South Africa working. Thank you very much. Thank you.